Good evening, and welcome to Rights to Realities 2021. My name is Nancy Reeves, and I'm proud to chair the Board of Trustees of the Women's Law Project. I serve on the board because I believe so strongly in this organization's mission, and it's a mission that sounds deceptively simple. The Women's Law Project leverages the power of the law to end uh, gender bias and discrimination. And the law indeed can be a very powerful lever for change uh, locally, across the state, nationally, but it has to be wielded with such tremendous talent and with strategy and with perseverance. And those are the qualities that the Women's Law Project brings to the ongoing battle for gender justice. Tonight's gala benefits the Western Pennsylvania Office of the Women's Law Project. And it allows us to support the girls, the women, the LGBTQ plus people across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in need of our services. I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight. If you're a sponsor, if you're a ticket holder, if you're able to take advantage of the opportunity to join us for free tonight because of the pandemic, your support, your advocacy and your activism make everything we do possible. A special shout out too to the host committee your time, your ideas have made this gala possible. And I think what everyone's gonna find is it's an evening that's both inspirational and a lot of fun. So let's get the show started, shall we? I really would like to introduce at this point our community education advocate in the Western Pennsylvania office, Tammy Patterson. Tammy, take it away. Hi everyone, welcome, good evening. I am here to introduce A.K. Payne. It's gonna be a treat. Um, A.K. is a playwright, womanist, and artist theorist. Granddaughter of the Great Migration, she and all her people hail from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Their plays love on and engage interdependencies of the Black past, presence, and futures, and seek to find, remember language that might move us towards our collective liberation. She holds a BA in English from and African American Studies from Yale College and is currently served pursuing an MFA in playwriting from Yale School of Drama. AK is represented by the United Time Talent Agency. AK. Hi everyone, um, it is so good to be here tonight uh, with uh, the Women's Law Project. Um, I will be sharing a monologue from a piece called Ain't No Dead Thing. Um, it's a play that tells the story, it tells the story of the 1921 um, massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, in Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and yeah, I'll be sharing this monologue from this piece. Uh, it's a character named Edwina, um, who is talking to another character named Marnie. Um, if you can give me one moment and I will share the monologue in just a second. I keep thinking about 1918 and graduation night in those woods near the high school and how in that second we were all we wanted in the world and Tulsa just seemed to crack and dissipate and Greenwood was really all we've made it to be, was really the heart of the world. And we were free, really free. He wants me to have a son. All my life to have this body, to know it, to learn it, cover it, peel it back, dance on it, with it, through it. These fat thighs fight, press, pour, make love to you. I've learned to love. And then the cavern torn, and then a child come forth. And then a life walk around and whisper things I said in another life. And then I'm suddenly shadow again to this being I want to plant all the dreams I never got to grow. I never got to grow. And my body again is another's body. And my body again is something I got to learn anew. And I think in some ways this is the beginning of death which is the extraordinary paradox of this life that death always starts with life. I think in some ways the beginning of death is this perpetual forgetting and remembering the body and the day that's coming fast where there is no longer any recognition. Maybe. There is no home for us. My body must be my home. If even that is ever changing, I've lost. I feel myself losing faith that there is any home at all. A life with no home has no meaning to me. I can't have his baby, Marnie. 
I don't think I can imagine having a baby with this body and that truth sits real deep at the core of me. And he can't see that. He won't ever be able to see that, to see me. He's so blind with his vision, his future, his white picket fence, his... Thank you. Um, and just for a little bit more context, the play uh, takes place in Greenwood District, Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's a character named Noah who owns a diner called The Ark. Um, and this character I just read um, is speaking about uh, not wanting to have a child with a man that she is in love, or a man that she is married to. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Um, that is so powerful and so profoundly timely, AK. Um, thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Carol Tracy, and I am the proud executive director of the Women's Law Project. So let me also welcome you to our Western Pennsylvania celebration of our annual Rights to Reality events. For those of you who are new to the Women's Law Project, I work out of the Philadelphia office. At last May's virtual Rights to Reality, we did not fully understand the magnitude of the pandemic and its tragic consequences. George Floyd was still alive. Trump was still president. Children were being separated from their parents at the border. And the siege of the nation's capital was unthinkable. Today, it looks like the pandemic, at least in the United States, is coming to an end. The nation is acknowledging the long overdue need for racial equity. Immigrant families are being reunited and a pro-choice president is in the White House. But during all this tragic and chaotic period, the Women's Law Project has continued its relentless efforts to protect re reproductive freedom and gender equality. You'll hear much more about that later in the program from Sue Fritchie, our senior attorney and the director of the Western Pennsylvania program. I want to take this opportunity to thank our friends, our sponsors, all of our supporters for your steadfast and unwavering support of the Women's Law Project. But now I want to introduce Jesse Beckett McWalter, who will pay tribute to two of our most loyal and ardent supporters. This past year, the Women's Law Project community lost two wonderful people, Dr. Jane Fuhrer and Kathy Ferraro. Throughout their 38 years together, they were both fierce and born vocal advocates of social justice, civil rights, and women's rights. Jane was a professor in the Pitt English Department for 40 years and an advocate for people experiencing discrimination both in the academy and beyond. She served on and chaired the University of Pittsburgh's Anti-Discrimination Policy Committee which among other things, worked to establish domestic partner policies at the university. Kathy went to Chatham and CMU, working in computer science and technical writing. Kathy, who described herself as the connector in chief, frequently brought people to the Women's Law Project community and introduced them to the great work of the project. In fact, when I first moved from San Francisco to Pittsburgh in 2007 and first met Jane and Kathy, Kathy quickly organized a lovely dinner at CASBA so that Sue and I could meet, and I've been in involved with the Women's Law Project in some way or another ever since. Jane and Kathy introduced countless people to the great work of the project. They always attended this annual event, and I'm sure they are here with us today in spirit. So I wanted to take a moment to recognize Jane and Kathy, dear friends and supporters of Women's Law Project and fierce advocates for the work the project does every day. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And now it is my great privilege to introduce Professor Kim Mutcherson, co-dean and professor of law at Rutgers University School of Law, and I might add a former board member of the Women's Law Project. Professor Mutcherson's prodigious scholarship focuses on reproductive justice, bioethics, and family and health law. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, uh, Kim. It's so good to see you. 
Thank you so much, Carol. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you um, and everyone else in this virtual space uh, this evening. Um, uh, it's particularly great to be here to share this space with people who, like me, have a really deep respect and admiration for the amazing work that the Women's Law Project has been doing um, since 1974. And I'm gonna refrain from telling you how old I was when WLP was founded, um, but I will say that I was likely still being potty trained and prone to saying no a lot. I'm deeply honored to have been asked to deliver tonight's keynote, and I wanna thank Sue and Carol for entrusting me with this task. After what we can all agree was an extremely difficult, to say the least, 2000, I mean, 2020, wow, um, and a tough start to this year as well with the Capitol insurrection, I have found lots of comfort and normalcy. And to me, lawyers who are social justice warriors are exactly the kind of normalcy that I need in my life. I was 10 years old when I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer and my desire for that career stemmed from a hope that I could be part of a movement for change in this country, this country that from its founding has been a deeply flawed work in progress. And when I graduated from law school, I became a public interest lawyer to fulfill that dream. I enjoyed and was buoyed by the work that I did, but life, as I'm sure you all know, sometimes has other plans for us. So though I didn't go to law school to be a legal academic, I became one. And I've always treated my career in academia as a chance to be an academic activist. That means I wanna be a person who uses the platform and privilege that come from this role to amplify issues and voices that need to be heard and that need to be heeded. And that's what I did for many years until the dean at our law school accepted a job in another law school. And in the space of a very few short months, I reluctantly found myself stepping into his shoes. The ride has been a bumpy one for a whole host of reasons, some of which you can probably imagine. Now, I don't expect you to know anything about the history of my law school, but I'll tell you that it began in 1926 as South Jersey Law School. Then through various twists and turns, we eventually became a branch of Rutgers many, many years later. So in the 90 plus years that the law school has existed in some form, every dean at Rutgers Law School in Camden was a white man until me. When I was appointed, I became the first black person, the first woman, the first LGBT person to ever be the dean at my law school. And just let that sink in, if you will. This country had a black president before my law school had a black dean. So in its over 90 years of existence, no one who looked like me or who had my life experiences had the job that I now have. So I have some sense of what it means to insert yourself into spaces where you're not expected to be or necessarily welcome. And I feel like that's something I share with the folks at WLP. When you're fighting for the rights of women and for gender justice in all of our different and delightful permutations in a country that still seems painfully reluctant to give so many of us our due, the work is an uphill battle and uphill battles inevitably lead to fatigue, to burnout, and to frustration. It's therefore vital for folks who are doing this kind of social change work to not just believe in it on a theoretical level, but to believe in it at their core. We must have faith that the work of lawyers can change not just individual lives, but can change our entire society and ultimately our world. And over the last decades, the folks at WLP have been leading change in Pennsylvania and beyond, but also doing what can be very difficult for organizations, which is keeping up with and transforming their work to make sense within the changing legal and societal landscape. The expectations that many of us have for a women's rights organization or gender rights organization in 2021 are quite different than they were in the 70s. We expect our advocates to understand and act within an intersectional framework. We expect our advocates to recognize the challenge that the reproductive justice movement and framework created by black women in the mid nineties raised and continues to raise for most of the existing mainstream organizations focused on gender and women's rights. We expect our advocates to be able to see the connections between and among a wide range of social justice issues and maintain core principles while also embracing the need, the necessity for coalition. 
And perhaps most of all, we expect our advocates to be willing to hear and consume constructive criticism so that their work can be advanced and expanded. The issues that WLP pursues today are no doubt very much part of the mission of the organization since its founding, but they're also beautifully expansive. The wage gap continues to be a stubborn issue, especially across racial lines in this country, um, which is also true of both employment discrimination and ongoing pregnancy discrimination. The Hyde Amendment still makes abortion an unrealized right for too many women and other pregnant people, and an obscene number of bills and laws are being promulgated by state legislatures who are determined to keep people who can become pregnant from terminating pregnancies. Sexual assaults continue to be underreported and survivors of assault and domestic violence are still not believed in far too many cases. Women's sports are still being underfunded despite Title IX. And amazingly, in 2021, we are still fighting about access to contraception. Along with these perennial issues have come challenges like prosecutions of pregnant women, especially black women for illicit drug use during their pregnancies, bills that seek to ban trans kids from playing sports on the appropriate teams or for using the bathrooms that match their gender identity or receiving gender affirming healthcare. There are many abuses of undocumented people in this country. And we are living, we are living through a public health crisis of police violence, especially in black communities. And of course, the unacceptable rates of black maternal mortality. And then add on to all of this, a global pandemic that impacts every single one of these issues and which was a challenge that none of us saw coming. What I love about the Women's Law Project is that the work is fundamentally about being willing and able to challenge the status quo and demand that the spaces we occupy make room for us in all of our glory. And the us that I'm referring to is very broad. It includes women and people of all colors, people who are cis, who are trans, people who are queer, people who are married, unmarried, partnered, unpartnered, living with disabilities, who are pregnant or parenting, who are survivors of assault or domestic violence, and so many more of us who from this country's founding have been told that we are not good enough, that we should wait our turn, that we're too loud, we're too abrasive, we're not smart enough, we lack ambition, um, that our success is only because of affirmative action or a need for diversity, that our tactics to inspire change are too in your face and will turn people away from our cause. But if we're to make change, we have to embrace the reality that we are the ones we've been waiting for all along. And as I think about the work of the Women's Law Project, I think about all the folks who paved the way for me to build the career that I have built. I know, of course, that I am the Black gay female dean at my law school, not because I am the first qualified person like me to come along, or because I am singularly talented and therefore rose to the top. There were undoubtedly women and people of color at many points in my law school's history who could have been excellent deans, but somehow I was the first. And unsurprisingly, the media relations folks at my institution wrote a press release about my appointment that touted the three firsts that I brought to the role with me. And I was truly overwhelmed by the publicity that I received when the announcement went public. I was interviewed for and appeared in multiple articles. I got invited to lots of different places to deliver talks. I heard from old friends and acquaintances and even received a congratulatory email from the preschool teacher who taught me how to read. And at several of my speaking engagements, I had young black women in particular approach me to introduce themselves, to chat, and sometimes to ask for a hug. And I was so proud that I could be someone in whom they saw themselves reflected and could imagine imagine a different future. The attention was really overwhelming for a while, and it took me a bit to appreciate why people were making such a big deal out of my appointment, especially when, to be frank, I thought it was a bit embarrassing that I was ticking off so many identity boxes at a point when this first should have already been in the past. But in the end, it did all come to make sense to me because when someone like me succeeds in a very public way, it feels like a victory for so many folks whose journeys have been much more difficult than my own. I got tapped for this deanship because I'm very talented, I am smart, I am hardworking, but I'm not uniquely special in that way. 
I became a dean because I'm talented, I'm smart, I'm hardworking, and I had opportunity. And that opportunity came my way because of the path that so many others forged for me before I was even born. And it's only because the path I walk was paved before I arrived that I was able to walk it with relative ease. Like everyone in attendance this evening, I didn't get here by myself and I stand on the shoulders of giants. To paraphrase James Baldwin, my crown was already bought and paid for and all I had to do was wear it. I got to this place where I can wear a metaphorical crown on the unbowed backs of women like Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, and Angela Davis. I got here because of the black women who walk miles to their jobs as maids and housekeepers rather than sit at the back of the bus. I got here because of the black women who sat defiantly at whites only lunch counters and refused to move. I got here because of the black women who sat in boardrooms full of white men and refused to leave the table and would not settle for crumbs in order to stay there. I got here because someone else would not take no for an answer and demanded that this country become what it has long claimed to be, a place where anyone can be anything if she's willing to work hard. It saddens and frustrates me that the legal profession remains one of the least diverse professions in this country. And I know that we can and we must do better. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, the faculty at Rutgers Law School adopted a very explicit, uh, explicit statement about Black Lives Matter and anti-racism. And it's incredibly fitting that law schools are at the forefront of the effort to make our profession and our world better. After all, the law is a righteous for profession. And 2020 gave us so many reasons to think about how our world and our country can be made better. For some, these years have asked us to continue the same conversations about race and racism and America that we've been having since we were small kids sitting around the dinner table with our parents. For some, it's meant taking stock of the ways in which our lives have been privileged or burdened by the accident of the skin into which we were born. For some, it's been recognizing that there is no such thing as colorblindness in a country where black people are disproportionately impacted by a variety of societal ills, including over-incarceration, low-wage work, lack of health insurance, over-policing, inadequate public schools, the digital divide, and more. We can't get past racism by pretending that it doesn't exist. And for all of us, it's meant struggling with the conflict between the country that we'd like to see and the country in which we actually live. But here's the good news. Lawyers, as they long have been, are part of the solution to what ails us and will light our way to a brighter future. Not all lawyers, of course, to be fair, but some, in fact, many. And those future lawyers are in our law schools today waiting to be shaped into our professions and our country's future leaders. And they will be inspired by the example of folks like those at WLP for whom the law is a tool for societal transformation. Law schools are a critical cog in the machine that will build that better world we're trying to get to. But we can't, can't send great lawyers out into the world unless they get opportunities. And unfortunately for too many folks who look like me, Law school is a pipe dream. Even in 2021, we live in a country where too many people would rather see black folks in prison garb than in power suits. We need more good lawyers out there doing the hard work of dismantling the ways in which the law has been a tool of, of oppression as well as a tool for freedom and justice. We need to be fighting in courtrooms and boardrooms, in law schools and law firms, in state legislatures and in Congress. And I know that we're capable of fighting because getting into good trouble, as the late Congressman John Lewis would say, is a hallmark of the history of marginalized people in the United States. At this time, when it feels like the world is a little bit on fire, I know that many of us are pulled in multiple directions when we think about how best to use our time, our money and our skills. As I've moved through my life and earned lots of opportunities, I often think of a line from Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise. It's one I'm sure that many of you have heard before. She wrote, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I often reflect on the power of that truth about how America has changed. As part of a wave of women, especially black women who have become law school deans in the last two years, 
In fact, there are 28 of us or will be as of July 1st. I know that progress is possible and that change is inevitable. My ancestors came to this country in chains and survived terror that I can only imagine so that I could have the life that I lead today. So that women like me could lead law schools, could lead law firms and nonprofits and state agencies. So that Stacey Abrams could be the first black woman from a major party to run for governor and then create an organizing machine that turned Georgia blue when she lost. And so that Kamala Harris could be the first black and South Asian woman to be vice president of this country. I believe that as Ayanna Presley once said, we're not here just to take up space, we're here to create it. And that idea, the idea that women should be allowed to take up space and that we should create space for other women is what motivates WLP's work for gender justice. Leading change isn't easy, as any public interest lawyer can tell you, but I don't expect it to get easier in the months, years, decades to come. But even on my worst days, I know one of the most important reasons for me to be in the role that I am in is that we've now gotten this first out of the way at my law school and we get to move on to the next one and the one after that and the one after that until there are no more doors that we have to beat down, no more ceilings that we have to shatter. My job in keeping with the mission of the Women's Law Project is to usher in a future where doors are flung wide open, where all that sits above us is sky and where we can truthfully say to our children, in this country, if you work hard, you can be anything that you want to be. I look forward to continuing to join my voice with those of my colleagues in law, whether they're in the academy or courtrooms or legislatures, in the spirit of honoring those who came before us and lighting a path for those who will follow. Many thanks again to Sue and Carol for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. And I hope that when you leave this event today, you will be ready to take on and defeat the many challenges to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kim, for inspiring us and sharing your story this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, my name is Brittany Green, and I am the Associate Director of Development for the Women's Law Project here. And I am very excited to be announcing our nominees for our Say What contest this evening. Now, if you've been to uh, Rights to Realities in the past, you might be familiar with Say What. Uh, but what it is, if you're a newcomer, is we, are, we have five different nominees of terrible people who said terrible things about women this year. And it is up to you to decide which quote uh, made you say, say what? the most. So uh, the winner of this terrible contest is going to be receiving a certificate in the mail congratulating them on helping us to raise money for women's rights. And so with that, here are our nominees. Um, the first one is a uh, quote from a viral video of Pastor Stuart Allen Clark in Missouri. And uh, that quote is, I'm not saying every woman can be the epic trophy wife of all time like Melania Trump, most women can, can't be trophy wives like her, but maybe you're a participation trophy, but uh, you don't need to be looking like a butch either. Uh, so that's really gross. Um, up next, we have a quote from Matt Rowan, who is an Oklahoma sports announcer who was caught on video calling a high school girls basketball team the N-word. And in his apology about that, he said, I will state that I suffer type one diabetes and during the game, my sugar was spiking. While not excusing my remarks, it's not unusual when my sugar spikes that I become disoriented and often say things that are not appropriate as well as hurtful. Um, on a personal note, I'm a type one diabetic also and I have never called anyone the N word when my blood sugar is spiking. So um, I don't think it's a very good excuse. Um, up next, we have one from uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, and this was about Representatives Rashida Tlaib from Michigan and Representative Alan Omar from Minnesota. And she said, I really want to go talk to these ladies and ask them what they're thinking and why they're serving in our American government. They really should go back to the Middle East. So that one's also very gross. Um, and uh, next we have... Governor Kim Reynolds of Iowa explaining why she's calling for restrictions on transgender athletes. Uh, she said, is there girl sports or is there not girl sports? Uh, so 
super, super transphobic, uh, fantastic nominee for this contest. And the final quote that we have is from state rep Aaron Bernstein, or Bernstein at a hearing just a couple of weeks ago here in Pennsylvania on abortion. And this was directed towards a physician who was testifying an abortion provider. And he said, so I'm going to send you my email address later and I'm going to copy my wife on the email. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you have somebody that wants to give their child up for adoption and is looking for something, you can reach out to us anytime. Or if there's anyone else even considering, we will personally find parents for these kids. So that one's just kind of an oddball. So um, at this point, those are the quotes. Uh, we're throwing the link into the comments here. So make sure you go down and click on that link in the comments so that you can vote on which quote is the grossest, which one made you say, what did that person just say? <laughs> um, and then we'll be announcing the winner of this contest uh, towards the end of the night. Up next, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sue Fritchie is the director of the Western Pennsylvania Office of the Women's Law Project, as well as being a senior staff attorney, and she's my boss, and she's here to tell you a little bit about what we're working on and uh, what we have to look forward to in the coming uh, year or so. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Sue. Thank you, Brittany. It is so nice to be here. I'm having a really good time, actually. Um, so uh, as as Brittany said, um, I run the Western Pennsylvania program for the Women's Law Project. And um, when COVID hit last March, my ambition for that office was simply just to survive. Um, we didn't know if this organization, which is now nearly half a century old, and the Western Pennsylvania office is nearly 20 years old, we didn't know if we were going to collapse in the chaos and isolation and mess of the pandemic. Our supporters, though, saw to it that we did survive. And I am so grateful to all of you for having our back and by standing with us through this extremely difficult past year. But we did a lot more than just survive. The pandemic challenged us to get creative and to adapt our legal practice and our advocacy strategies, and we did. So we are now holding judicial bypass hearings remotely through video conferencing technology. And this has actually been tremendously helpful to the petitioners. It alleviated a serious barrier um, for young people who found it logistically difficult and terrifying to have to appear in person before a judge in downtown Pittsburgh. We have now represented petitioners in over 100 judicial bypass hearings, and my brilliant coworker, attorney Christine Castro, leads that work. We saw how hard the pandemic has been on women and continues to be on women. Low wage workers who lost their jobs when the economy shut down, mothers torn apart trying to balance caring for their children and teaching them from home and also working a full-time job. We saw the special stress on pregnant workers. So we brought sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and LGBT harassment cases this past year. And the insight that we've been able to gain from that work has led to an expansion of the project, a new project that I am so excited about. We want to fortify pregnant workers, especially low wage pregnant workers with free legal information about their rights and free legal representation. So when they go to negotiate for a reasonable accommodation from their boss or for time off around the birth, or for a clean and private place to pump if they're breastfeeding, they won't have to worry. They will know their rights, they will have us at their back, and they will have a strategy for getting what they need. We're calling this idea a legal doula service. My brilliant coworker, attorney Margaret Sang, in our Philadelphia office pioneered it and we can't wait to bring it to Pittsburgh. 
Access to abortion is getting more impossible in state after state, and we're surrounded by two of those states, Ohio and West Virginia. Um, we are already seeing an increase in patients coming from those states here in Pittsburgh. Um, but while abortion care is being shut down uh, all over the country, here in Pennsylvania, we have massively expanded access to abortion by helping our intrepid abortion provider clients negotiate the regulatory thicket and get approval to offer medication abortion through telemedicine, another result of the pandemic. Um, doctor in one location, patient in another. In a state as big and rural as Pennsylvania, with only 17 freestanding abortion providers in the whole state, telemedicine abortion is game changing. And we're fighting to remove the biggest barrier to abortion in Pennsylvania, the Medicaid coverage ban. Our case challenging that ban is now before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and the stakes couldn't be higher. Uh, with our co-counsel out at the Troutman Law Firm and Planned Parenthood attorneys and my brilliant coworker attorney, David Cohen, we are appealing from a Commonwealth Court ruling that not only threw out our sex discrimination claim, but shockingly took a page directly from the national right-wing playbook and held that physicians don't have standing to come into court to defend their patients' abortion rights. That is contrary to the case law at the state and federal levels. Decades and decades of case law, no other jurisdiction has such a rule about standing. We're working now on Supreme Court briefs arguing that the Medicaid ban is sex discrimination, pure and simple, and it is time for it to go. Pennsylvania, like many states, is witnessing a wave of anti-LGBT legislation, including what was earlier referred to a particularly nasty bill that would prohibit trans girls from playing on girls' sports teams. The five female co-sponsors of this legislation claim to care about girls' sports. You know what? They have public high schools in their districts. And guess whether the public high schools in their districts are in compliance with Title IX's equal participation requirement. They're not, and we know they're not because we track these things. The Women's Law Project will fight this terrible and hurtful bill and expose the hypocrisy of its backers. My brilliant coworkers Amal Bass and Tara Murtha lead that effort. There's so much more to tell you about, about our Title IX work, our advocacy on behalf of sexual assault survivors, exposing crisis pregnancy centers. And I invite you to email me or call me or corner me later at the happy hour in Kumo space after the program, if you want to hear more. But I hope that very soon I can thank you in person and that this time next year, we'll be celebrating together in the same space, in person, face to face. And until then, healing and hope to you all. And now for a little fun, back to Brittany. Hi there, Sue. Um, and thank you so much for those remarks. And that's, uh, we have one last segment here before we announce the winner of Say Say What. And uh, I know we don't have a link in the, in the comments just yet, we're working on it. Um, but uh, before we move into uh, that and also uh, our happy hour in a little bit that I hope you'll join us for, uh, we have a little Women's Law Project trivia. So we have three contestants this evening who will be battling it out for the legendary Diva Cup, which I have here. You might recognize it from our Battle of the Auctioneers uh, at our event two years ago and three years ago. It's a very prestigious award. Um, so let's go ahead and meet the contestants. First up, we have Jordan Fields. Jordan is a former student athlete who has worked with us in the past to help promote our Title IX work. And she is currently working as a policy coordinator in Mayor Peduto's office. Um, 
Hey, Jordan, how's it going? Hey, good, how are you? Um, great. And then next, uh, I want to also introduce Lee Carpenter. Lee is a board member at the Women's Law Project, law professor at Temple University. And earlier when I talked to her, she told me she has an interest in becoming a uh, smoke jumper. So a uh, little fun fact. <laughs> hey, Lee, how's it going? Good. I, I actually asked if you would tell them that I was something more interesting <laughs> than a law professor, and I thought Smoke Jumper sounded better. Um, it does. It does. I, I mean, let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Sheila Ramgopal. Uh, Sheila is the medical director at Allegheny Reproductive Health Center right here in Pittsburgh and a longtime uh, supporter of the Women's Law Project. So um, good to see you, Sheila. You too. What's a smoke jumper? Oh, it's like a, a special forest fire like extinguishing person. It, it seems it. like super cooler than what I do. <laughs> Anyways. 100%. Thank you guys all so much for being here tonight. We are going to do six questions and each of you is going to get the opportunity to answer two of them. And then the person who gets the most of their questions right wins the Diva Cup. If there's a tie, we have a tiebreaker question. So let's go ahead and get started. My first question is for Jordan. Um, and the question that we have is, in the 1970s, Pennsylvania had 145 abortion providers. How many abortion facilities are there in Pennsylvania today? Um, and we have the answer, the possible choices up there. A, 20, B, 145, C, 17, or D, 98? I'm gonna go with A. Ooh, very good guess. The answer is C, 17. Wow. All right, yeah. you've got a chance to recover. It I depends do. on how well uh, Sheila and Lee, Lee, Lee do here. So um, question number two is for Lee. Uh, when was the last time that the Pennsylvania equal pay law was updated? A. 1967, B, 1990, C, 2001, or D, 2010? All right, I'm going to go with A. You are correctly, fantastic job. A, 1967. Here's me pretending I didn't guess. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> All right, Sheila, you're up next. Uh, the question that we have is, when was the Pittsburgh office of the Women's Law Project founded? A, 1986, B, 2002, C, 1975, or D, 1999? Dude, y'all, Sue was saying it was 20 years ago. So I'm gonna say, oh my God, this is 2021? Yeah. So 2002. Correct. Nice job, Sheila. All right, so right now we've got Jordan with a goose egg, Lee with one, and Sheila with one. But Jordan, how do you get to try to redeem yourself now? Where you're, you're up next. All right. So uh, our next question is, uh, Pennsylvania requires people under 18 who need an abortion get the consent of a parent or a court order uh, called a judicial bypass, where they go before a judge. How many judicial bypass cases has the Women's Law Project brought over the past three years in Allegheny County? Um, and we have, and I feel bad, Jordan, because I feel like you're getting the tough questions here. I know. Um, but uh, we've got A, over 15, B, over 35, C, over 50, D, over 100, or E, over 500. This is very difficult. Um, I'm going to go with D. You are correct. Fantastic. All right. You tied it up. All right. That was a good one. That was a hard question too. All right. <laughs> Lee, the next one is for you. Um, Get ready. I'm ready. All right. The Women's Law Project helps pregnant and parenting uh Pregnant and parenting workers and students fight pregnancy discrimination and get the accommodations they need to stay employed and stay in school. How many pregnant or parenting workers and students has the Women's Law Project represented since September 2017? So we have A, approximately 20, B, approximately 150, 
C, approximately 80, or D, approximately 40? I'm going to guess C. Ooh, nice job. Approximately 80. C. All right. All right. Yeah. So you've got Jordan is knocked out of the competition. I'm so sorry, Jordan. No, Jordan. He is two for two. Ah, come on. All right. Now we find out if we need the tiebreaker question. I'm a bonnet. Uh, the next one is for you, <laughs> Sheila. The I'm next question is. <gasps> okay. Thank God I have this white claw with me. <laughs> it helps you think. It, helps it does. You think. It does. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Sheila. <laughs> Approximately how many pages of abortion statutes, regulations, and policies are there in Pennsylvania? A, approximately 2,500, B, 500, C, 1,300, or D, 3,000? Oh my God, Brittany, I'm pretty sure it's A. Oh, no, the correct no, answer no, 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 is C. Sure. No. Uh, so that means Lee Carpenter, you are the winner of the prestigious Diva <laughs> Cup. Yes! Congratulations! I'm gonna I fly this next year in Philadelphia, and um, we're probably gonna you. need it yeah. for our Battle of the Auctioneers last year. Do you have any final words? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I owe it entirely to White Claw. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to thank my parents. <laughs> And the Women's Law Project. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys all so much for participating. This was a ton of fun. Um, and up next, I get the pleasure of closing out. I think that we ended up getting the link for Say What in the comments. So hopefully people were able to go ahead and vote on that because I get to announce the winner of Say What, who gets to... Um, who is going to be receiving a letter a certificate in the mail uh, congratulating them for helping to raise money for women's rights. And so uh, if we can get that up on the screen, because I actually don't know who the winner is myself, hopefully people got the chance to vote. Do we have that? Oh, yay, we have it. Oh, and the winner is Pastor Stuart Allen Clark with the gross quote about being a trophy wife and maybe not looking like Melania Trump, but maybe not looking like a butch either. So thank you so much, Pastor Stuart Allen Clark, for being gross this year. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It looks like nobody has voted. That's a shame. Well, you know what? We'll keep this up and um, we can announce this on social media later. We'll go ahead and post this on our social media and you can vote on it uh, now and maybe during the happy hour. But um, I will go ahead and uh, close out this evening. I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to spend some time with us. And I especially want to thank anybody who sponsored or donated to this event this evening. Uh, in past years, our sponsors have made it possible for us to invite people who maybe wouldn't be able to afford to uh, buy a ticket to our event. And we're really glad that we were able to have a free option because I really feel like this is a great opportunity for more people to learn about the Women's Law Project and get kind of welcomed into uh, what, we're, what we've been working on. Um, and while our costs this year are lower because this is a virtual event, Rights to Realities as an event does raise one third of the funds required to operate our Pittsburgh office. So if you're able to, if you're feeling a little bit generous, I highly encourage you to go ahead and hit up uh, womenslawproject.org um, and maybe kick in a few bucks in honor of this event and help us to keep running all of the wonderful work that we that you heard about tonight. Um, I also wanna make sure that if you registered for the event that you know that you are invited to join us on Kumo Space for a virtual happy hour. It's a really fun platform. You can have a little virtual glass of wine and walk around the virtual event space so you get the option of choosing between five different rooms uh, to join us in and you can mingle with your friends just like if we were in person. So just make sure you close your YouTube window before starting up your webcam so it's not auto playing in the background. But uh, with that, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and I hope I see you in the happy hour. Have a great night, everyone.